Welcome to the Strategy with Jason podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Strategy with Jason. Today, I have a very special guest, an old friend of mine from just across the border in sunny Florida, a little punk. It's snowing. I got 18 inches of snow right outside my door, and he's in shorts. I have the one, the only, the oh-so-famous Mr. Jeff Stearns in the house. What up, Jeff? (laughs) I want you to know that I felt bad about today so you're saying i'm wearing shorts but i'm actually wearing long pants but it took me 10 minutes to find them <laughs> of course of course it did. and you said 18 inches do you uh, how do you know what it, oh yeah you're, yeah because i'm an american original. i still i still think that way <laughs> you're a yank you're a yank like you know what an inch is <laughs> hey what? jeff for everybody out there that's watching and listening right now and don't know who you are and how you got started in the industry i thought it'd be cool to kick off today's podcast with a little origin story so how did you get started in this crazy little world we call the automotive industry well it wasn't hard uh, to decide. My dad was an independent dealer in Detroit and I started going to work with him. My gosh, when I was eight years old and it's not one of these car washing stories or anything like that. I mainly went to hang out and talk to customers and he was mainly into the antique classic muscle car, but it was a different era. He was selling restored model, a roadsters okay, that's cool. for $1,300. And this was mid seventies and he felt guilty because he was making $400 a car and his average per copy was a deuce a car. (laughs) So it was a little bit of a different world. My dad was a a, God rest his soul. I lost him about 10 years ago. He was a very well-known guy in the city of Detroit. He didn't take any deposits. Everything was handshake because he was from the neighborhood and Mm -hmm. you were from the neighborhood. So if you didn't keep your word on a deal, you just lost your credit line at the orthodontist or the bar or at the bookie. (laughs) <laughs> he sold he, he sold his business in the late 70s and moved to Florida to ensure that my brother and I wouldn't go into it because he, he was a great guy, but he didn't love all the 60s and 70s used car managers in Detroit that he was dealing with. Sure. He, so he wasn't in love with the, all of the people in the business. And I intentionally went into the business, uh, started selling cars after second period my senior year of high school. <laughs> you know what? I went to an ice cream shop. Once it's in your blood, it's in your blood, right? I mean, like I said, I, I, find, I find people get into the industry one of three ways. Either they were born into it, which kind of sounds like you were, all right? Either you stumbled your way into it. Maybe you did that as well, all right? Or you're like me, you actually got conned into it. I don't know. Maybe that maybe that happened to you as no, well. No, no. I wanted to go into it so bad, and I really let my dad down. I don't think he told people was, what I did for a living. He was so until disappointed. I was, <laughs> was like, until I was yeah. like five years into it. You know, my brother, he was proud of. He was a children's book author. I was the car salesman. So you, you were uh, the, you were the other son. Is that what it was? I you, was the other son. But like you said, you know, once you're in it, I always said that the car business is a little bit like getting bitten by a vampire. It's not what you do. It's just what you are. And once you've done it, you just about have no choice. But I've always loved it. I was in retail for 27 years. And when I went into the vendor side, I definitely wasn't looking for a job. I loved every minute of what I was doing. And For other life-changing reasons, I went to the vendor side to be available for my sons, that sort of thing. You came to the dark side. (laughs) But my fix is talking to dealers all day and making them the victim of my unsolicited (laughs) advice all day on how to run their store. You know what? We got a chance to uh, chat a little bit before we started recording today. And I love the the vampire analogy that you have because I got to be honest with you. um, You know, a lot of people are still talking about digital retailing. And and I got to be honest, every time I hear that word, I just kind of... Just, I just feel feel like vomiting on it. I just, it blow it, it just drives me nuts. It's a buzzword that I just still even today I don't think people really understand it. And I feel like people are 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 bitten by the vampire of digital retailing and they're mesmerized by something that's just not really what it is. And we want to talk about this. I want to get your kind of thoughts on this. You know, I believe digital retailing is a process, not necessarily a widget. And I know you got some thoughts on that as well. So, what do you think, process or widget? Definitely process or as you'd say up there process <laughs> so uh, i had an episode the other day it's not out yet with sean armor you know sean mm-hmm. i think you had him on your show no sean's great and i loved what he said he said digital retailing is just bringing the dealership into your house and i i like that a lot whether mm-hmm. you're process or widget but i'm definitely a process guy and if you're in the united states i know how to pronounce process don't worry about it and i also know how to spell <laughs> color properly 
So the thing that we've been doing, I've been with Car Chat 24 for nine years. I don't know if we mentioned that. Mm-hmm. My day job is day job. selling car, boat, and RV chat. We branched off in a boat and RV when a lot of our car dealers said, hey, can you do my boat lot or RV lot? But when I'm, we've been guiding customers through the shopping journey on the website for 13 years now yeah. before digital retailing was a thing. And I understand from a widget standpoint, an idea on my trade, let me structure my own deal, even if I'm lost and how does my payoff play in and all of that business. But in the end, I still think that the best deal is a customer talking to a salesperson, a little rapport built, a little trust built, and frankly, the right product brought up, because Mm -hmm. let's face it, what percentage of the people leave in the car they were researching anyway? It's got to be under half. It might be under 20%. Well, it probably is. And you know what? I, I look, it, it's a process first, I think a technology second type mentality. And I think right now there are still a lot of people out there that are just looking for that magic diet pill. And the cool thing is, you know, I think with live chat and I was, I was really early on live chat. I mean, I, before there was even an automotive specific live chat, I, I was using it in 2004. And then and that's actually how we connected. Uh, funny enough, I was at GM at a dealership and I, I think I called you up and you're like, Canada, where, where are you looking? <laughs> It, it, um, but but they but have no, websites in Canada now. They have websites. You guys sell cars up there, and not and not just uh, uh, horse and buggy. So yeah, no. Um, but I'm no. trying to find your original <laughs> email while we're you on see, this podcast. Seen how long it was I, ago? <laughs> it, it it I'm certain. Well, I don't know if you remember when you were at that Chrysler store, but I'm feeling like six, seven years. Am I? Oh, it's got to be longer than that. I bet you it's probably pushing closer to eight to nine. Um, but yeah, no, it's, 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 de- it's definitely been a while. Um, well, here's an email where you referred me somebody in 13 <laughs> Yeah, there you go. and in we 20- were obviously already doing business at your own store before that. So, okay. <laughs> but you, you know, I, find, I think though, even all the way back then bringing live chat into the dealership was not necessarily for me, just a widget, you know, like I had to build out a very, very strong process on how these things were going to be handled. And then I was able to kind of open up those floodgates. And I, I still find today that dealers still don't necessarily embrace that. Are you, are you seeing the same? They, they focus so much on the widget or the tech and they don't spend enough time in developing the process. Well, naturally, I mean, even though I am a vendor, I mean, what I really am is a salesperson mm-hmm. and I'm a fanatic about process and about the human interaction and a student of all that. I mean, when I started selling cars in my first two years, and I, I was talking to Billy yesterday on his show, I know, so I don't overrepresent, I read about 150 sales books and it might have come near 200 and they weren't all sales. It was how to dress and <laughs> psychology and NLP and sale, you know, everything and Joe Girard's book and all that. But so I very much believe in the process. I very much believe in the people part. I think from a dealership standpoint, I don't want to offend anyone. It's like easier to at least think you've implemented a software or a process than train a human being on how to be an absolute expert in their craft of selling. Right. No, it's true. We use these widgets as like crutches. It's like we, we it's, it's easier just to go out and buy this widget and, and just throw something uh, onto our website versus actually spending the time to, to work with the talent that's already at the dealership. And, you know, I'm a little concerned because like, I, I feel like we haven't nailed down our communication processes good enough as an industry, um, to move on to where I think we're heading next, which is, which is video chat. Like I I look, I'm excited about video chat. I love being able, like, it's one thing to be able to black and white text chat with someone right over the, right over, uh, the website. It is a whole other thing to be able to see someone face to face and see their eyes and their, and their tonality. And just, you can see the intent to want to serve, but I don't know if we're necessarily ready for it. What do you think? Well, I mean, subject to someone flossing after lunch before they get on the uh, video chat. I mean, I can imagine some of my old staff with the spaghetti stain or the crooked tie or the spinach still in his teeth from lunch. But I think that if somebody is into the craft of selling, like actually wanting to pay attention about what matters to another human, and I don't just mean... And I want to be cautious here. I don't just mean meeting the, because it's each piece of this is an hour conversation. Yep. If we meet the customer where they're at, 
and just give them what they want. Like, let's remove all the friction. You know, Brian Ben stock all the time. Let's remove yep. the friction. And I'm not going against them. I want to re remove fr friction wherever I can. But I've been doing focus groups for 30 years. And focus groups have been saying that they want, for example, one price selling. Why do they want it? Because they want your best price up front and a price on their trade and a payment and a rate without a commitment from them parenthetically so they could take it to the next guy and see if they could beat it by 100. Exactly. That's what they want. We could all, you know, we say that giving a customer what they want will result in a business that flourishes and stays open a long time, <laughs> but we can't always give them what they want and stay open. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm saying that broad brush, I'm not saying that we can't meet them. So if it's all about just give them everything what they want, I believe in a little bit of give and take. And I believe that we've got to cooperate a little to get them going. But in the end, I can tell you in my career, and I don't think that human DNA has changed that much. And I talk to dealers all day, every day too. And I know when I'm talking to a product, uh, a, a software process store, and I know mm -hmm. when I'm talking to a human craftsman type store, and I don't want to offend anyway, because either one executed beautifully can be executed beautifully. I lean towards the human piece, but in the end, the customer that doesn't know about Dr. Jones, the veterinarian's three-year-old trade-in with 5,000 kilometers on it can't be guided by the staff. And if the customer says that they want to be in control of everything, these digital retail tools puts the customer in all kinds of control or perception of control. Exactly. And they think they want control, but I believe they don't want control. I think they think they want control. I know they when I perception. go to a restaurant and it's very expensive where I should have it my way more than anywhere else because it's expensive and I'm getting ready to order the fish. I want the waiter to say, eh, I think I'd lean away from that. I want the person to confront me a little. And this 100%. is what I think a salesperson should do in a store if they're good. Well, and, and I, I agree with you. I look, I think, look, I love transparency. I love connecting with them, but it just seems like, and this is not all locations. It really isn't. I think there's some phenomenal dealerships out there that still have some true sales professionals in the dealership. But I feel like it's just, we've got to the point now where it's like the process goes almost too far to the point where it's just like, we're just going to process the entire relationship. And it, it, that's just one thing you can't do. You can't process, you can't process the relationship. And, you know, it's like we have these amazing tools that are now allowing us to connect with someone faster. All right. And before they come into the dealership and I'm just trying to think, you know, you know, how, how do we train our staff, you know, to actually be able to, you know, turn on one of these things, or these phones, right. And actually have a conversation with the intent to want to connect where I find that so often when I talk to a dealership or I secret shot a deal, shop a dealership, their intent is they don't want to connect with me. They just want to sell me something. All right. You know, they'll right. be so fast to give me a payment and a discount without actually ever taking the time to connect. And I feel like, you know, the consumer wants to connect before they purchase. And I'm just thinking your thoughts, your experience. All right. How do we get our team back to a place where they're connecting first before they're selling the product? Well, this is very interesting. And this is a pet topic of mine. Mm -hmm. So, um, my background, you know, you asked about origin, and I'm going to give you a little bio autographical example here, not bragging, just saying what really happened. I didn't walk uphill both ways through snow or anything. But when I got into career car selling, I took some orphan owners and service customers and all the stuff that the store wants the sales staff to call but I wanted them. No one made me do it. Mm -hmm. And I started calling them relentlessly and we can get into the process I used to get them in and get report. But what I used to do on this green bar IBM paper that you're too young to remember, Jason. <laughs> Thanks. That's true. But on, on my green bar customer report, I would put one, two or three stars. One star is I called them up. They had no idea who I was. First call. Second star is if I could say Jeff Stearns, but not say the store I worked at. If I could move them to know who I was by Jeff Stearns, they got another star. Mm, I like that. And if I could move them, and I would test everyone after the first call, of course, and say, hey, it's Jeff. And if they knew who it was, hey, it's Jeff, it would be the, four, the third star without me having to say my last name or where I work. I like this that. was my process. And then finally, there was a bonus fourth star, but most of the watchers on this show will be too young to remember phones in your house with other extensions. 
But when the husband or the wife would yell out, hey, it's Jeff, pick up the other line. <laughs> <laughs> so they could both talk to me. Then they got a bonus fourth star. Now, the reason awesome. I wanted to do this prior to selling them is I found, and I wasn't the best closer on earth. I ended up doing a very consistent and good job. I made my first six figures in 87 when I was 21 or two. So I mm-hmm. even never went back. So, I mean, I was like, okay, right? Not like, you know, Mr. Maida doing his hundred cars <laughs> or whatever. But, uh, Part of my process was building such a rapport that the negotiation piece and landing piece, because the trust was so high, was really small. And when somebody was too soon in my process, like we need a car right now, like I would cold call an an orphan and say, hey, your timing's perfect. We just got in a wreck. On one hand, of course, you think, yay, lucky timing. But on the other hand, I'm like, I don't have three months of conversations with these people. This is going to be a difficult negotiation. And I would exactly. usually be right because then it would be all about money and grinding. And you know what's funny is out of all the things we measure and in a good dealership, there's a, an insane amount of data that we do measure. But what you right. just said is one thing that I don't think, man, I could probably name maybe three dealerships off the top of my head out of the thousands that I've known that actually will measure um, how well we connect with the customer. And, you know, even though, yes, yours was an old school method and you used paper and pen, but I don't see anything wrong with that because it shows how well you connected at a relationship. And, you know, once you build those relationships, right, your business skyrockets after that. I mean, I mean, come on, Jeff. I mean, how many referrals did you get from the connections that you created? Well, I actually wrote a sales book and I haven't done the sa- the seminar in a long time, but I was doing seminars about 15 years ago and I needed health insurance and I couldn't buy health because I have a special needs son. So I had to go get a real job again, but I did that for about a year and a half. And the name of the course was off the floor in 24. I'm saying within two years, if you do this, you won't need ups anymore. But in my case, after 18 months at that store, I was done with fresh floor traffic other than overflow on a week. And if somebody asked me to wait on someone or something like that, and again, not massive numbers. I mean, I was doing for 13, 14, 15 cars a month, but with no ups in my early twenties had a, you know, a little time behind me building the relationships and putting over a hundred hours a year on my boat. And that was, that was another measurement. And it's so funny. I should have invented a CRM because I called it customer relationship management. I didn't know that was CRM. And when I moved into the exotic car business, so fast forward to the late nineties, just before 2000, I got into the Rolls Bentley Lotus new car franchises Mm -hmm. and all of the odd used cars associated the the used Lambo, Ferrari, uh, upper Mercedes, Porsche, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And I, when I moved into that department after running this Cadillac Landover store and we bought this Rolls franchise, so I was moving same store, but just moving into that department. I said, I want to move out of the three by five card system in the IBM paper. I want to do something computerized. Now, remember, this is 98, 99. So no one had a laptop at their desk. And I remember asking my owner if I could spend a lot of money. It was like 1800 bucks for a little Sony Vio. And not that I was being fancy on the brand. It was the only one I could find. And it was small. And I wanted to be able to throw it in my briefcase. And I called Sony and I said, look, I want a program where I could look a customer up by name, where I could get a reminder, just like my three by five card, if I would move it out or my barber's appointment book, if I would move it out three months to call him <laughs> in three months or call him on his birthday or anniversary, I would do that. Or, or when I find a certain trade in, I had my system there. I want to be able to search by keyword in it. So if they're looking for a Bentley Turbo R or they're looking for a red Porsche or whatever, mm-hmm. I want to be able to search by something that would remind me of the person carrying a poodle, wearing a pink sweater. I think he's gay. You know, whatever would make me remember the guy from four months ago or gal. And then I want reminders. And he said, well, there's this program called Outlook. It'll do all that. So I, cause you had to order the software when you ordered the machine and I took Outlook and I got reminders searched by keyword and put my star system in there of how I got to know him. And ironically, moved the needle on this Rolls and Bentley department from 15 a year to 300 a year within three years. Wow, that's that that's something else. But you know what though? It, look, uh, the tech has may change may have changed, but the process hasn't changed, right? And this was you know, and you got to know why you're doing it, Jason. It's well, not just 
getting rid of your tasks. You got to say, I'm trying to get a relationship. There you go. And you know, that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, we got to stop just checking out the proverbial box that we did shit. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, okay. That's done. Uh, follow up number 16. Okay. That's done. Follow up number 12. That's done. Like, no, 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 no. It's like there, there needs to be intent behind our communication efforts. Right. And I find right now that the only intent behind our communication efforts is get your name and phone number, uh, get you in the door. All right. And let me get, let, let me, let me present a payment to you as fast as humanly possible and bypass every opportunity to actually connect to you as, as a human being. And, th- and that's in, and when I see great tech like live chat and video chat, that makes me nervous because those products are designed for the purpose of making that connection. And yet we're not using them that way. We're using well, them just to, to just oh. to get the information. I know you're, we're both I? going there. Yes, I forgot absolutely. you're Canadian. I got to be all polite. Yes, right. you do. <laughs> By the way, how do you make a Canadian apologize? I, I, how is that? Step on his foot. <laughs> Good one. Okay. So here. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Go okay. ahead. That's uh, okay. Now that I know you've got that going on, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of opportunities. All right. So with chat, the thing that attracted me to chat and what made me join the company, I was using car chat 24 for a couple of years when I was running a BMW store here in the Tampa Bay area. So I was a customer of the company. I was very happy with the company, whether I'm smart or not is one thing, but obviously I loved them to leave a retail career that I loved and ended up joining them. And I haven't been disappointed, but the thing I love about a chat lead is what I loved about a chat lead when I was running stores, which was when my salespeople or myself, if I'm the manager on and the lead comes on at night and I want to take it or my BDC could do is read the chat transcript instead of calling the customer and saying, um, I see you submitted a lead. We could leave a message or start a conversation if they answer the phone or send out the first couple lines of a template email. Mm-hmm. Hey, Frank, this is Jeff over at uh, BMW. I see that you were chatting with Stacy. Oh my God, it was 1 a.m. You know, I do my <laughs> surfing at night. Now I see you're looking for a three series, but you're also worried about fuel economy and you have this to trade and you're worried about your credit and you're worried about your negative equity and your whatever. Yep. And I could turn it into a human conversation, but I could also see in the lead, their browsing history, the stuff they were looking at yes. during the chat. So now I got even more ammo, whether I can more talk to them or leave a message. Yep. I could see they were looking at these other like models. Hey, Frank, and by the way, I know you're asking about a three series, but have you considered the Audi, whatever model? Because I had one on the lot that I see that he looked at four times during the chat or that he was all over my credit app or that he was all over my trade tool but he didn't mention a trade. And by the way, I need, I'm really need trade. And so if you or anyone in the household mm-hmm. has something to get rid of people with a trade in are getting a 10 times better deal. And now when I talk to him, I wasn't going to bring that up, but I'm glad you brought up the trade. I got all these clues in the chat and I even have their GOIP information. I can see what browser they're using and operating system and what cable company up there will be Rogers, right? Or whatever. <laughs> and I just loved all the clues for real rapport building conversation starters so we don't just bill. run into the showroom. I mean, like, yeah, Jason, what you said, let's just jump right into payment. I mean, God forbid, can we let them smell the leather in the thing? I mean, no, I know. The, like, the, let's let's um, let's bypass all foreplay and let's just go straight to put the ring on the finger. And <laughs> it, it, well, I'm glad it, you moved it straight to move it, putting the ring on the finger. Well done. Well, well done. Is, but that's what it is. Like, I'm serious. You've seen you see hundreds of thousands of communications. All right, that are coming from dealerships websites, and you've seen these responses. They are that ugly. I mean, they're they're literally just let's go let's go from here to here, and let me put a ring on that finger. And I wonder that, and, and I, I, this is my next question for you: is our, I guess our lack of building that relationship does that come from? Because I think for a lot of dealerships in our industry, we've lost the art of telling stories. Because I'm trying to think how do I connect with other human beings is I connect with them through stories. So do you feel like we've, we've lost that art of, of telling stories? Jason, I think so. And it's funny. Um, and I don't want to make this a chat commercial, but that's the business of it. So <laughs> the, um, I'll get fired, right? I'll get fired. And Jeff, we got to get rid of you guys. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, well, I mean, Thanks for trying us. And I hate to see anyone go. I don't want to save you at all costs, but can you tell me what? Yeah, your leads suck. <laughs> we close them at 3%. Yeah. 
okay, I've got them. Really sorry to hear that our leads suck. Um, by the way, where are you closing your other internet leads? Oh, about 3%. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I've also been told, Jeff, your leads don't work in a crisis. I'm not, this is your story. Man. This is getting in. Your leads don't work at a Chrysler store. What do you mean? Well, we're keeping you in the Honda store that you're killing over there, but we just can't get arrested with your leads at the Chrysler store. We're going to get rid of you. <laughs> I say, let me ask you something. Who's processing the leads? What's going on in each store? Oh, well, we have a central BDC, but these people over here process the Honda leads, and these people over here process the Chrysler leads. These guys do the imports. These guys do the domestic, whatever. Mm -hmm. I've gotten a couple of dealers to play when I said, listen, your cancellation is ticking down, You know, whether it's 60 days or whatever. Your cancel is ticking down. Do me a favor if you don't mind for fun. Let's switch the team on who's handling which leads for which store. Like and that. all of a sudden, the Chrysler's killing the Honda store. <laughs> so when it comes to stories, and that's a very, very broad, like if you said to me, hey, Jeff, like, a, like an ink blot test, you know, yep. what is that? Well, of course, it's always a uterus, but that'll be for another time. <laughs> uterus, uterus. So <laughs> thanks. Sound bite, but <laughs> but like a um, ink blot test. When you say to me about let's talk about stories, I'm like trying to imagine what part of stories you mean. There's like the dealer heritage story. Exactly. There's the salesperson's background story. There's the story about the make and the story about that model. There's the story about that pre-owned car. There's a story about who owned it. Most important is the story of what you and I have as a human connection. Yep. And then bring in what is going to matter to that client in all earnestness. I don't mean like create a false case. No, 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 no. I, I look, I totally get what you're saying is it's, it's, um, I call it kind of preloading, right? It's like through stories, let me tell you what you're going to get when you buy into this brand. All right. Um, let me tell you what you're going to be a part of when you own this type of vehicle. All right. L let me tell you um, how it's going to be. All right. When you decide to give me the opportunity to earn your business. All right. These are the stories that have to be communicated. All right. That not only connects me to a product, but also connects me to the person behind the product which is that salesperson. And that goes all the way back to what we originally talking about. You're, you know, uh, off the floor in 24. All right. The, the only way you can do that is that you successfully sell the story before you sell the product. Do you, do you agree? I do. Well, I shouldn't say the only way because the, the missing component is the CRM after the sale. Not oh, good the point. That's true. Yes. But the staying in touch. And by the way, and I don't remember what sales trainer said it. We don't need, it might've been Jackie Cooper. Anyone? Okay. Now all <laughs> the, everyone under 70 is going to shut this off now. But you don't need to ask them how the car is doing. No. If the car is hemorrhaging the driveway, they'll tell you. Hemorrhaging oil, they'll tell you. You don't need to ask them how the car is doing. I'm just checking in when you have the license. God forbid would it kill you to give me a referral or however you'd word it. That works for me because of my personality. Sure. But also, and I'll let you know this, that sometimes I would follow someone for months and years and then discover they bought elsewhere and they'd be very apologetic because we had all this rapport where they're picking up both phone extensions. Jeff's on the phone or putting their mobile phone on <laughs> yeah. speaker. Jeff's on the phone. Jeff, I, you know, we were on vacation. We were walking around. There was a showroom. We saw this Hyundai. I'm sorry. And I would always ask them when they bought elsewhere, if they were in my area and with the exotic cars, they were almost never in the area. We shipped almost everything. But if sure. there was any other make that you would buy locally, I would say, please bring it by as soon as you can. I want to see it. Please bring it by and show it to me. If it was a make I understood, I'd give them a full delivery hand over hood and trunk best I could. If you understand one brand, you pretty much understand any brand other than if you don't know how to work their nav or something. For sure. But I'd give them the very best understanding of a hood and trunk handover that I could on the car that they just bought elsewhere. I love that. Knowing that they're the guy they bought it from Probably didn't do, 50-50 well, probably didn't do a phenomenal job. Sure. And remember, you're never competing with the other dealership. You're competing with the other person. 
Ooh, that's and a I good just, point. That's a good point. Can we actually expand a little bit on that? Because sure. I find too often when I'm in discussions with dealerships is that they literally think that is what their strategy needs to be is how they're going to compete with another dealer. You know, when in reality, to your point, when it comes right down to the sell, it's not the other dealer they're competing against. It's the other person that they're competing against. Can you just elaborate oh my a little God. bit on that? They're dealing with ABC Motors. They always <laughs> sell at a grand under. Or they always give too much for the trade or we can never beat the. All I'm thinking about is showing up better than the other person that they're probably dealing with. Exactly. I didn't know the dealership. I don't know my uh, local grocery store. I don't know. I know the people that, that my cashier and the person who bags that I, you know, kibitz with three times a week when I'm in there. If that person's bad, the store's bad. If that person's phenomenal, the store's phenomenal. I wouldn't know another thing about the entity. And backing up to the human connection piece and smelling the leather, there was a point I really wanted to make. Mm -hmm. The easiest product on earth to sell, Jason, probably, like if you want to be an order taker, is an iPhone. Is that fair? Sure. When a new one comes out, I mean, would you like to have customers coming to you the way they have customers <laughs> camping out? Literally camping outside, yeah. <laughs> They still have a showroom, bro. It ain't all online ordering. They still got to show it and look at it and feel it and enjoy the craftsmanship and and get some kind of connection with, I think they're called geniuses there. I'm a Samsung guy. I'm not one of you weird people, but still. <laughs> so you Saturn no. people, you Harley <laughs> Davidson people. But no, it is. It, look, look, it is about creating that connection. And I feel with digital retailing, kind of going back to that, it's connect, It's just creating that connection before they come to the showroom. I honestly don't even think the process necessarily is. Look, the, the process really hasn't changed. It's just where the process happened. Now it's changed, right? And this kind of goes into kind of my next question with you is I find more of that connecting or the opportunity to connect with the customer happens more now online than it does in the showroom. The showroom is just kind of almost like the second touch point. Um, where do you see website communication evolving over the next few years? Well, um, if I'm right, I'll be a millionaire and I haven't been <laughs> right <laughs> to that extent yet. But earlier you mentioned video chat. Yeah. We came out, Car Chat 24 came out with video chat five, six years ago. I've been with the company nine years. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get and cut it out. I, this is a recorded show. Cut it out. I don't, this is appropriate. I could not get laid in an all female prison with a fistful of pardons with video chat <laughs> Nice. over the last few years. Finally, when COVID hit, people and dealers started coming out of the woodwork saying, I hear you have video chat and it's wonderful because for example, you and I are having a conversation. We already know each other. We already like each other. We yep. have some uh, familiarity with each other. Yet, talking to you with video on this recorded conversation, I'm feeling more connected to you than just driving, having you on speakerphone. For sure. That's my experience. Okay. I got your eyeballs. I could see your posture. I could see your facial expression. It's just different. So if somebody's doing video chat and they can get a little eyeball, and then, you know, let's just get a little logistical. They can walk them out on their phone cam and show the interior of a car. For sure. And serve them a little bit. You're up in Canada. I don't know if you ever heard of this store up there. They're a decent sized Mercedes store called Silver Star Montreal. <laughs> yeah, I'm familiar with them. <laughs> you heard of that one? Okay. Yeah. I think they're pretty, pretty big size. So when COVID hit, of course, they had to fur furlough a lot of employees. They'd been on my fully managed chat. Actually, Sean Armour brought us in there. And yeah, Sean I was just talking his, to him earlier. Yeah. Yep. He was brought us into his next store. And and he was a MR, mf -er. the deal. <laughs> I'll tell you, whenever Sean Armour called me about anything, I, I peed down my leg. Let me just admit it <laughs> right now until we, he'd really trained us. I mean, God bless him. So, but one thing that Silver Star had was fully managed chat. We answered everything, which is our core business. Probably 80% of all of our dealers, we answer everything. I can yep. get into why later if it even matters, but we answer everything. If leads count, if the lead count matters to you, <laughs> let us answer everything. But if you want someone to build connected and relatedness with later, get a lead, God forbid. You know, don't just give them all the info goodbye, like a poorly handled phone up, right? Exactly. So Silver Star ends up furloughing everybody over the mm -hmm. COVID issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to their GM, Paul, Super sharp guy, obviously. Look at what their store does. And says, listen, myself, 
the GSM, new car manager, used car manager, service director, et cetera, are going to pretty much be waiting on everyone or taking all of the inbound leads until we can spin paperwork or land them on a car or get it to the three yard line. If you guys know what <laughs> yes. American football is up there, do you know what a yard is? The yeah. three meter yeah, line. I know that one. <laughs> and then we'll spin paperwork and send a salesperson to a, to a client's house for home delivery. Mm -hmm. So th the reason he wanted them to switch to self-managed where the store management is answering is because now they're going to get into a frank discussion about trade, about a real car price, about a payment, about a lease payment, about negative equity, about credit issues in the way that really only a manager on a TO should do it, that a salesperson really shouldn't. For sure. So it's proper that a manager is doing it. So they, they were ha they're having high success with this. And what they ended up doing is with our video chat that they're utilizing is they're having F and I do the F and I menu through an appointment chat at three 30. Come on, say your name's Frank Jones. And the F and I manager is delivering F and I menu with video so he can see eyeballs. See, now that's just awesome. You know, and that, that is, that is just a perfect, perfect example of kind of where we started our, our conversation today is that it's, it's process before technology. And look, a, a, a piece of technology is a tool. A tool is only as good as how well it gets used. And, you know, when we really focus on that process, if it's the CRM or if it's video chat, you know, it's like, it's all about making those connections, right? Telling those stories and then being able to fulfill their needs as far as the vehicle goes. This has been, this has been a really great chat. And, but before I let you go, because I know our time is up today, Jeff, I think there's a lot of people out there watching and listening, and I would love to connect with you and kind of continue the jam about this conversation that we've had so far today. What, what is the best way to connect with you? Well, of course, my favorite website is belltobell.ca. Did <laughs> I say that online? Yeah, that's a good one. You're supposed to so plug yourself, not me. <laughs> If you want to connect with me personally, go to jeffsterns.com, J-E-F-F-S-T-E-R-N-S. -E this houses all of my podcast. Oh, can I mention yes, my podcast? Absolutely. May I? Thank you. I mean, that is how you lowballed me onto the program. <laughs> exactly. So about two years ago, and I never watch or listen to any podcast, but about two years ago, I was fundraising for a product up in New York. I was at a steakhouse in Midtown Manhattan for a digital product. I do a little consulting like we all do. Right. Yep. And I'm sitting there in the steakhouse as the guy that's going to answer to the investor, how this product's going to play out in a dealership. If anyone has a question or legal or DMV or logistically or moving the car or dealer licenses, all these kinds of questions that could come from the investor. So they'd be out talking to the investors in this uh, private room in the steakhouse and they'd wave their hand once in a while and call me over and ask the question and I'd help best I can. But meanwhile, the fellow that takes companies public, I don't understand that business, fellow named Izzy sitting in the corner is a podcast freak and he watches all of these product walk around videos and I drove a car 200 miles an hour videos and yep. et cetera. And because I'm mainly killing time sitting with him for 12 hours over on the side in the steakhouse in between, and he's telling me about the Ford GT that he had at sticker and he should have bought it because now he's divorced from his wife and she wouldn't let him get it and wouldn't let him add on to the <laughs> Long Island house garage and, and the roles he took because someone owed him money and you know, whatever, you know, his car stories that everybody likes to tell a car guy that they think that we think are interesting, especially the fourth time we're hearing him in the steakhouse. He says, you should really do a podcast because you aren't just doing a car walk around presentation or driving it 200 miles an hour. You're an actual car guy that ran stores, had all of the cars, dealt with all the people, dealt with the manufacturers, whatever you got credibility. And I said, okay, that's interesting, but I'm busy, right? I'm working all the time for sure. And he stayed on me until I says, you know what? I think I want to do it. And then COVID hit. And the vision <laughs> was to do it in person, like Joe Rogan at a table. Yeah, exactly. That was the vision. So, and that's all I knew, right? My example. So I ended up not doing it because of COVID. Plus I got all of my naturally, understandably panicking dealers canceling or whatever about, or let's stall our chat for a few months during COVID. None of us knew. Thank goodness it turned out that chat became 10 times more important as people were stuck at home and all over their websites. But uh, it ended up being fine. But I spent a couple of months uh, counseling dealers, right? As they were standing on you. the ledge and I forgot about it. Well, 
Another piece of my life is about eight, nine years ago, sadly for my children, I got divorced happily for my gorgeous new wife and baby life uh, moves on, but always sad for children in that uh, Mm -hmm. situation. So when I got divorced, I put my nose to the grindstone, want to make sure to provide for the kids, want to make sure to be available for the kids. That's why I changed careers. And I went reclusive. You know, it wasn't an exciting thing for me to talk about. There wasn't a lot of winning involved in my life. So sure. even dear old friends that were calling me, maintaining the relationship, I wasn't even calling people back. I wasn't even calling people back that owed me money. You know, that <laughs> calling me. like I don't, I just didn't want to talk to anybody. So somebody said to me, you really should start the podcast. It's going to force you to reconnect with a lot of old friends. Oh, no, 100%. That's what it's done for me. Okay, there you go. And I picked up the phone and I just started it a day. And thank God I got about 6,000 contacts in here. And I just started dialing and saying hi. And then I had to not only say hi out of the blue, it had been five to 15 years since I talked to anyone. But I had to give them an ask that I have this idea and I'd like to have you on my show. And the response was like, that'll be a ball. And really all we did was book it. And then the catch up conversation that we might as well have had over coffee or dinner or whatever ended up being recorded. (laughs) And it's been um, very, very, very gratifying, very good for the soul. Uh, A lot of people that have listened said they can feel that and they love it. And I've had some interesting people. I've got the General Motors exec that built the plant in Russia. I've got Derek Bell, the race car driver. I've got Malcolm Bricklin. I've got um, a Ferrari, Bentley, uh, Lotus exec. I've got the General Motors of Rolls Royce, who was employee number one when BMW bought Rolls Royce. I've got a very interesting wholesaler that <laughs> dabbles in everything, who buys mountains of boats and auctions them off after hurricanes and bought 100 Humvees from the military and became their value assessment when military was getting rid of uh, equipment and became a partner in Meekum Auction. Um, a, an exotic car sales guy, uh, the number one exotic car leasing guy in the United States. And then some of my old customers, like the founder of Red Lobster and the owner of uh, a steakhouse in Indianapolis. That's like a, a racer's Mecca outside Indianapolis. Where everyone This sounds observed. like literally the most epic podcast ever. And yet, you've, it's been yet fun. you've yet to even tell me what the bloody name is. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling a story here. <laughs> no. I need another 15 minutes. The podcast is Jeff Stearns Connected Through Cars, because whether it's a manufacturer, whether it's a dealer, whether it's someone associated with a business or a client, we're all connected through cars. And that's how we met. That's uh, awesome. And- that's awesome. I'm so excited to uh, to check it out. I know everybody out there is watching and listening going to check it out. You know, also, make sure you guys connect with Jeff on LinkedIn as well. Jeff is just an absolute wealth of information. Uh, Jeff, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to jam with me today. This has been an absolute blast. We are most definitely going to have to do this again. <laughs> and uh, also, God forbid, I mean, Thanks. one of the things, God forbid, can I get a referral out of this? I mean, we're trying to get known as human beings. One of the things that made me crazy as a dealer was my auto trader rep, for example, when I'd have a little bit of a complaint trying to tell me how to run my store, and yet she'd never sold one car. So I am your vendor that sold at least one car. And through all of this, if you feel like you have some familiarity and you're thinking about chat, God forbid, to feed my kids, my new baby, can you give me an inbound lead about Car Chat 24? That's literally been the best plug and ass I think that we've had on this show to date. So (laughs) thanks again, Jeff. I really appreciate your time. This has been a blast. You have yourself an amazing day.